Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. I'm uh, Dagny Corcoran, and this is Art Catalogs at LACMA. Um, I'm, for the first time uh, that I've been doing these programs, I've had to simultaneously fight off Michael Govan and the Prince and Drawings Department over the privilege of introducing the Mike Kaplan and Kenneth Turan. I'm glad you're all here, and I'm going to ask Michael Govan to start uh, to introduce the whole thing. Thank you, Dagny. How great is Dagny, right? Art catalogs. We love art catalogs. And we love these talks. Thank you, Dagny. Um, uh, we're here also because we're inaugurating the Art of the Movie Poster highlights from the Mike Kaplan collection. You can see that outside. And this is just part one. So um, the first is now on view through April 29th, and the second will be May 12th through July one, um, the curator, and extra special thanks go to Stacy Steinberger, who's right there, who's amazing, and who was the lead in putting this together, our curator. Um, and these uh, international posters from the golden age of, of movie poster design, uh, we're calling that you know, 20 to 50. Um, we are so excited about this. I personally have been watching our audience stop and look so closely at these posters. And there are two things that are in some way strongly new to LACMA in the last decade. One is a uh, strengthened commitment to cinema. We've done a number of exhibitions, as you know, from, uh, from Tim Burton to uh, Guillermo del Toro to uh, Gabriel Figueroa. Uh, and additionally, it's to um, posters and graphic design. And it's been a collaborative effort among many of our departments. Uh, so this project, Mike, really brings together those two new strands of LACMA's program. And thanks to you, together in the most beautiful way uh, they could be. Um, and I just want to say, uh, many of you here may know Mike Kaplan, um, who is a designer, art director, producer. Um, and this is a man who knows posters because he crafted posters and, um, and uh, campaigns. And most famous, you may have heard or seen those from, for example, A Clockwork Orange that he was responsible for. So uh, this is somebody who really knows his posters. And he has an eye, which is what we appreciate as a museum. Uh, he's collected two to 3,000 posters, right? Something like that, over 35 plus years. He now lives in Idaho, but is gracing us with his presence here, and he's been around LACMA. Um, and uh, he often presents posters throughout LA, including at the Academy of Motion Pictures lobby. We hope that with the opening of the Academy of Motion Pictures uh, Museum next door, that we'll see a lot more uh, programming around movies. Um, and so we're just, kind of the warm up for that. I will say, big plug right here, one of the reasons, the other reason we're doing this is we want to bring these posters and keep them in LA. And, and Mike's been very generous to offer um, gifts to us. And we're going to try to also acquire a large part of this. So if you or your friends know anybody, we're, de we're on a mission to, to, to make sure this poster collection stays in Los Angeles and right here. Um, and we're going to help do that, all of us. <laughs> Donations at the cash register, right, Dan? Um, and Kenneth Duran, it's so great to have you here uh, at LACMA and here to talk with Mike. Uh, everyone knows you are the amazing film critic for the Los Angeles Times, but also for uh, NPR's Morning Edition. Um, you talk a lot about movies, even celebrities, but to us, you're the celebrity uh, in your writing, which we really appreciate here in Los Angeles, We, the finest. Um, just to say, he's also the director of the Los Angeles Times Book Prizes. Um, You've been a staff writer for the Washington Post, TV Guide, and many, many things. You're teaching at USC, writing. Um, just since we're in a bookstore, your last book was uh, University of California Press, Sundance to Sarajevo, Film Festivals and the World They Made, and, uh, and also uh, Never Coming to a Theater Near You, public, uh, published by Public Affairs Press. So uh, books to read. Um, we're so excited that you're here, too. So I'm going to leave it to these two amazing gentlemen to have a conversation about movies, movie posters, and anything else they want to talk about. Welcome, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. It's so great to see so many people here about posters. I tell you, walking in from parking and walking past that wall of posters, it's just kind of an astonishing rush to see those great works of art 
on the wall together. So thank you, Mike, for making this happen. It's really, really exciting to be here and to talk about posters, which you know we are both big fans of. You said to me when we first started talking about this, you said that group on the wall, you said it's kind of an unprecedented collection. That was the phrase you used. And I wondered if you, wha yeah. what do you mean by that? Well, just well, first I just want to say that I was getting a rush also. <laughs> I mean, um, uh, th these are my posters, but I've never seen them together, and I'm never going to be able to see the entire collection together. I need an armory or something to <laughs> hang everything. But um, the ones that you're seeing on the wall are, um, it's unprecedented in the sense that there's never, <laughs> a friend I just saw. Uh, um, uh, what I was going to say is is that there's never been there's never been a collection uh, on one wall that have been that um, comprehensive and that significant as far as quality and importance and rarity. And so seeing them all together. As Kenny said, it was it was, it, it was like a rush, yeah. and yeah. I and like Michael, I was watching the people coming by for the last hour and a half and seeing what the response was, and it was just terrific seeing them taking pictures and looking at all the credits and reading the headlines on the Constance Bennett poster or whatever. So it is a unique assembly that you won't ever see again. And uh, from that point of view, it, it is, it, it's just uh, wonderful to be able to look at it. Yeah. Was it hard to pick the specific ones? Were you up late at night, kind of agonizing? Well, we, we uh, there, were, there were a few that, that uh, we wanted to have, I have a, about a third of the collections in Idaho now and uh. two thirds are in LA. So we were trying, I was trying to just pick the ones that were in LA. And so it was difficult, and uh, there were there were a couple that we wanted in this selection that we couldn't put in because of size-wise, and then there was just too many. So it was uh, a little difficult, but they, it's a wonderful range, and almost every genre will be represented between this uh, collection and the one that will open uh, on the second stage, which will be in May. Yeah, I was going to ask you about that one. What can we look forward to? What posters can we look forward to there? Uh, well, the ones in May, uh, there'll be another 12, uh, 11 or 12, and they will include um, A Night at the Opera, which is the great Marx Brothers movie, and it's also one by Al Hirschfeld, who did The Three Stooges, uh, The Big Idea Outside, and I'd been collecting him I know, since I was about five, cutting out the... Really? The, wow. Yeah, the, the, the caricatures in the New York Times yeah, yeah. Uh, Arts and Leisure section. Uh, uh, and I didn't even know that he did any color work yeah. until uh, uh, you know I was in the film business at all. I just knew of from his black and white um, drawings. Yeah, yeah. So uh, they're both great posters, the, uh, the Three Stooges and the Marx Brothers. There's a wonderful um, three-sheet of Barbara Stanwyck and Annie Oakley, which wow. is the only known uh, copy of that poster. Um, there's a Scarlet Empress with uh, Marlene Dietrich and uh, a great James Cagney of, of Blonde Crazy, which, uh, which is favored by some people I know. And um, there are two, two large um, Austrian posters, which are about nine feet tall by four feet. One of... Um, uh, film with, uh, it's kind of a real Art Deco piece with uh, Joan Crawford in a uh, gold Art Deco dress and with Clark Gable and Robert Montgomery kind of peering at her in tuxedos with cigarettes dangling from their lips, <laughs> which is really beautiful. Oh, so and true. the other one, which is one of my favorites, well, they're all favorites, is uh, also from Austria. It's of the Hatchet Man from 1932 oh, with wow. Edward G. Robinson and uh, Loretta Young in Oriental garb. Um, and then there's a Maltese Falcon and two two from Sweden, uh, and the Swedish posters to me, um, they have their own distinctive uh, design style, and they look as modern today. Uh, and they, they looked at modern 90 years ago when they were made, and they look as modern wow. today because they're really advanced, and one of them is of Things to Come, the science fiction mm -hmm. art deco. Do you remember the first poster you bought? Was there a start to all of this? Um, well, the first time I even knew I began loving posters from when I was a, a child. I yeah. thought I had like a, a DNA, and uh, uh, we got the Sunday New York Times. Yeah, yeah. I used to cut out the f the full page theater ads. Oh yeah. And yeah. then I would 
color them, uh, put pastels oh God, really? on them. Wow. And then, then I'd compare them with when we went to New York, how close I was. And oh I would God. try to get them, but I couldn't. And then uh, when I became a part of the film industry, I could get, get some posters. But by that point, you know, I loved some of them. I loved all the Soul Bass posters, which were unique. Yeah, and yeah. and um, uh, I would be waiting for the next Preminger movie to come out to yeah. see what the poster was yeah. going to be. But uh, the posters by then in the 60s were kind of got kind of mediocre and boring, and they weren't using artwork and illustration. They were using kind of photography and just slapping things together, and the best artwork was coming from, uh, from um, album jackets and the music huh. business. So the whole thing switched, and so when I started doing campaigns myself, I always wanted to do artwork in, il in, in illustration. So the first posters that I saw, someone told me that you could get older posters, and there was some um, memorabilia shop on 6th Avenue, and I went in, in there and I found a few of, um, I think one was a postman always rings twice, and the other was of, uh, it just had a famous tagline of, a film with uh, Clark Gable and Greer Garson called Adventure, and there was a famous tagline called Garson's Back and Gable's, Gable's Back and, and Garson's, Garson's Got, got him. So yeah, I thought that yeah. was. <laughs> and then, but then, uh, then I realized that thing, they were getting expensive, and I didn't want to get into it because I knew I'd get addicted. <laughs> and so I waited for another like eight years when prices were even more expensive. Mm. And I was looking for a, a present for a friend, and there was a, I don't know if it's still there, it was a shop, on, a memorabilia shop on uh, Melrose called Chickaboom. Huh. And I went in there, and um, there was a stack of posters, uh, of uh, older posters, and the first one was a poster of a film called Irish Eyes Are Smiling, and it was from a Fox musical from uh, the late 40s, and the star of it was June Haver. And I had a crush on June Haver. <laughs> and so, and she was in, you know, uh, a short skirt and Irish garb, and it was beautifully designed. It's probably not worth any more today than it was <laughs> then, but I bought that poster, and that wa was really, uh, that was really it. So it was all due to June Haver. So you, that's, that's when it started. That's when, that's when it started in, in uh, intensity. In earnest, yeah. yeah. And you're still, I know you said you were talking about this one, the uh, Farewell to Arms. You're still buying. This is a new acquisition. Well, it's not a new acquisition. It's new ac this was a new addition yeah. to this exhibit because ah. uh, oh, Dagny wanted two posters here, and so that was one, and the top hat that was added. And that one I've always admired um, because I love the lighting on Gary Cooper and uh, Helen Hayes's face, and I, and I just thought it was really dramatic and beautiful. And in fact... Uh, a little side story to a farewell to arms. When uh, a friend of mine's here who starred in the uh, TV f uh, film, very good TV film about um, um, Hemingway and um, Marth uh, Martha Gellhorn. Martha Gellhorn, and he played Hemingway, Live Owen. And when I went to visit him on the set, there was a poster of A Farewell to Arms, and I complained about it because they picked the wrong style. The other style is much more <laughs> mediocre. So, <laughs> now, Clive, you can see the, the, see the right one. one. Okay. Ah, uh, that's better. What are you still buying stuff? Are you have you called it quits? Or I haven't sure? called it quits, but I've I've um, I've I've stopped most of it. I've tried <laughs> to put a, uh, a hold on it because. There are not a lot more that I, there, there are others that I, I would like to have, but as far as the great rushes that you get when you know you, you see something or yeah. the jolt that you say, yeah, yeah. there aren't a lot that, that give me that. But what's happened is that I've, um, I've got in my mind a lot of different exhibits that could be done with various themes. So if I see something, one of them is called How They Smoked. So if I, if I find a poster of someone smoking a pipe or a Cheech and Chong or whatever it's going to be, yeah. uh, well, I say, well, that's going to, that'll be great in the exhibit. Whether or not I really love it, I mean, I would like it, but it, so, so it's expanded beyond what I originally intended, yeah. just getting posters that I love. I feel that those posters are kind of the, the popularity and the cost of them. I know you felt you waited too long, but they are going up and up and up. I know there was a Lon Chaney poster that was sold for, uh, I think, almost half a million dollars, the London After Midnight. Yeah, I think that's the most expensive one now. And for a long time, the horror posters and the science fiction yeah. ones were the most expensive because they were more um, 
collectors who really prize them. Mm -hmm. And uh, I always felt that there isn't any reason why, you know, Top Hat should not be, which is the best uh, Stair Rogers movie and a great poster, should not be on the same level. So gradually there have been other posters that have reached um, into that, not quite of what London... Mm. Uh, London um, after midnight. But mm. yeah, no, London after midnight, but in the high, f uh, high five figures mm. of wow. five, six figures. But, um, and ca the Casablanca posters today are all really highly, d they've had a, a jump in value in the last two years that's been mm. remarkable. But um, as far as the value of, uh, of them go, uh, the posters go, I've always felt that the drawer if, and the drawer of the collection, the foundation of the collection is design. So if the design doesn't appeal to me, I'm not really interested in the poster regardless of uh, its other historic value or, or whatever. And so um, it was interesting in, a, in an exhibit that uh, I've done about five exhibits on a theme called uh, Gotta Dance, uh, about dance movie posters of people mm -hmm. dancing, whether they're from musicals and non-musicals that are used dance images. And um, the biggest one and the, the most satisfying was the Jacob's Pillow in Massachusetts, which is the dance mecca of, of yeah. the country. And in that, there were a whole range, there were about 80 pieces, and uh, the people were res responding as much to the most expensive posters as to like a, a reissue from East Germany of West Side Story that had George Shakiris and Rita Marino in it. And it wasn't it wasn't the value of it. It was the aesthetic, and that's what I excitement. that's what I yeah, love about yeah, it. Yeah. Talk about I mean, you mentioned the foreign posters. I mean, it's different. It was different with foreign posters. I mean, you said that they had their own sensibility that mm -hmm. they didn't care that much about what Hollywood wanted. They wanted to kind of speak to their own audience. Can you talk talk about some examples of that? Well, I think that um, t times change today. We can get into. We, well, we won't get into much, but today's <laughs> movie posters, they all kind of look the same, and you can't read the credits because they're all squeezed in at the bottom, and they're all photography done with Photoshop, and they don't use uh, work in illustration. But in the golden age, or so what we're calling the golden age, the 20s to the 50s, the foreign distributors, the, uh, the foreign offices of the, of the studios had the freedom to cr either use the artwork that was created here or to tailor it to their to their market, to their audience, what they thought. So in many cases, uh, the posters that were used were totally different than they were in America, and they were much more artistic for the most part. I mean, there were some great ones, which we have here, f of, of American posters from that period. But largely, um, even for secondary uh, B-movies, they would hire Im important artists to, to do the campaign and to do, do the key art. So um, um, I, I didn't discover those until way after I began again collecting the American posters, and then uh, I just kind of f fell in love with them. And you'd want to find, I'd want to find the best poster for the film, regardless of what country ca yeah. it came from. And the Casablanca outside ask you about that one, yeah. is, is an example of it. It's just a, a brilliant concept, and... Um, the American poster for it is, is not inexpensive, but it's just kind of very mediocre in its duotone, and it's got the faces on a newspaper, and it's, because it's Casablanca, it doesn't go cheaply, but the foreign posters of Casablanca are now much more, more valued, which is great to see because a lot of collectors in the beginning, uh, or a lot of collectors still only want country of origin posters, so huh. they feel that a foreign poster isn't as, as valuable or important as a country of origin, regardless of what it looks like. So um, they, I think, becoming more educated in accepting yeah. foreign posters now. Is that your favorite of all the Casablanca posters, the yeah. one that's out there? Yeah. 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 And talk a little about the Underworld poster, which has just got such an incredible intensity to it. Well, that was... That was um, uh, Von Sturberg's first English language film, I yeah. believe. So uh, that poster, which uh, came out in 1927 in America, 
And in Germany, uh, Stacy did the research and it's, it's stated on the post. It came out a year later in 1928. Uh, and it captures all the, uh, the intensity and the shadowing and the gangster element to it and the kind of the bullet hole going through. Yeah. And it's just a real p uh, piece of art. And recently I just saw the American one sheet to it, which even though it's from the great poster period, is very, very mediocre and generic. It's kind of got a clinch of uh, Clive Brook with uh, the actress and with a yellow background. It doesn't tell you anything about about what's going on in the movie at all. Yeah. They were selling it as kind of a romance or something. It's not, not much of a romance. No, no, and that, that poster is just a startler. Yeah, no, it's a great poster. Talk about, I mean, I know you say that often in these movie posters, even though we think of them as not necessarily being this way, that a lot of avant-garde design elements happen in them, that a lot of stuff like that happened first in movie posters. Do you have uh, anything Well, out particularly there? Um, from the avant-garde side, uh, to me, it's the Swedish posters, which combine, um, from what I know of uh, art history, kind of German expressionism and, and, and the Russian uh, school. And they combined it into something that was much more, uh, that was very advanced and unique, uh, but it also had a real kind of, I say, movie-movie element to it, so it was accessible to an audience. Yeah. And um, they're the ones that I think most fit what what um, what you're talking about? I guess in a way, maybe the Saul Bass school or his his uh, posters also just changed what most movie movie posters could be. Um, the ones from the 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 twenties and thirties are more representational and traditional, but done with a lot of you know, style and elegance. And what's unique to them also is that the way the credits are used, they become a part of the artwork. All, usually all of the title treatments are hand drawn and um, where, where the cast uh, positions are, they're not all at the bottom, they're, they're separated. And how, how the, they've devised that is really intriguing. So that becomes a part of, of the artwork as well, which again today, doesn't exist. Doesn't I, I want to talk about this poster, which is out here, which is one of my favorites. It's the, is it the biggest one out there? It might right, be the biggest one, one out it's there. The biggest, that one Dawn and Patrol. And the Dawn Patrol. Uh, which I think it's just, you know, I feel like, and I don't know if I even want to be there, but I feel like I'm in the cockpit I know. with well, him. Two things about this poster. Um, I had it in my house, uh, and it, it's a very large poster, so the only place it would fit would be behind the kitchen door. <laughs> and the kitchen door was always open, <laughs> uh, you know, it, because oh. uh, you know it was the summer. It's, yeah. it's L.A. and it was always we didn't have a screen door, so we were just going in and out all the time. So whenever it was closed, which usually would be the end of the day, I'd close it and I'd see the poster and I'd get uh, <laughs> a real jolt from it. Um, and it is, uh, it, it's and you may, it's the angle. It's a kind of that ver the diagonal angle going. Uh, across the top third that makes you feel that you're in the cockpit uh, of the dogfight. And the other thing about it is um, when I began uh, collecting, uh, y you mainly got them from uh, something called Movie Collector's World, which was a trade magazine that uh, came out every two weeks and everyone would rush to get uh, FedEx copies before anyone else. <laughs> and there were always these kind of... Um, semi-sleazy memorabilia shops, <laughs> either in New York, mainly in New York, and one of them w was called um, The Memory Shop, and was in the East Village, and um, the man uh, who, who owned it, Mark, I can't remember his last name, he was a, he was a nice guy, but very strange, and the, and the place was filled with, it was like in a basement or the ground floor, and it was filled with r stacks and stacks of um, folders, that were supposed to be organized, but they never were because <laughs> by the time everyone went through them, he never kind of reorganized them. And so, um, and also there was like water on the floor and there were mice droppings. I mean, it wasn't a pleasant place to go. But if you were addicted, uh, <laughs> it was fine. So um, anyway, um, 
I, 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 I would go there when I came in from LA, and uh, so I was going through some, some pile. It may have said Errol Flynn on it, probably didn't though, and I found the top two thirds of the poster. Um, and uh, it, it was a three sheet, and three sheets usually are in two or three sections, so they could easily get separated. So the top two thirds were together, and the third one was missing. Oh God. And so um, I had it for a long time, and I could never find the bottom third. And what used to happen is that, and still does, if, if a part of a poster is missing, it can be restored if you find a good restorer. And since the bottom third was just lettering, I was going to bring it to um, Igor Edelman, who was the main restorer in LA, and he was going to paint the bottom in. So it just happened that I took an ad out of Movie Collector's World selling a few things, and I just said, does anyone have the bottom third of, of Dawn Patrol? <laughs> and sure enough, someone called me, and he had the, the bottom third, and I said, where did you get it? And he said, I got it at the memory shop. <laughs> so it was exactly the, same, the, the correct third for the, for, for the poster from the same place. So that was really a miracle. That's amazing. Yeah. And he was willing to give it up? Yeah, he did. He did. Yeah, he did. Uh, I can't remember what I paid for it, but whatever it w he wanted, I paid. I remember. <laughs> I mean, I keep reading that posters almost like silent films. They keep finding them. I mean, there was this thing I read about called the Berwick Discovery or something. Yeah, that was them which, which Heritage found. I mean, they, they Talk crop Talk about up. what that is, if you know. You know. Um, I'm not sure where they found it. I think it's in Pennsylvania. Pennsylvania, and I think that they were all attached uh, to each other. Yeah. And so they had to go through a separation. I don't know uh, if there's a the conservation people of here of how that's done, but they had to se they separate. They were really thick. And in it, there were several posters that had never been seen before, including the two from um, Public Enemy, Public Enemy. Yeah. and one from... Um, Little Caesar, which I don't particularly like because it doesn't have Edward G. Robinson on it, so it doesn't represent the film to me. But anyway, it was. Uh, and so, s s you know, they're going to be found. I mean, that happens sometimes with manuscripts today or paintings that, mm -hmm. th that, that suddenly appear. There was also something in the Midwest where lobby uh, window cards, which are, have a thicker background um, and were basically used for to put in stores around the theater and the, the and the store uh -huh. owners would get okay. free tickets to go to the theater. I didn't know that. To, uh -huh. to put them in. So they, because they were a thicker cardboard, they were also used as insulation uh, in the Midwest. Uh -huh. So, um, <laughs> you know, they were tearing some houses down and the wall came down and there were all these window cards uh, in them. So you never know wh where they're going to um, uh, surface as part of the... Uh, the mystery of this. No, two, uh, you know, the two words that I think, you know, I always like to say them, and, you know, whenever uh, we talk about posters from the Golden Age, they come up, stone lithography. Mm -hmm. What is stone lithography, and why does it make some of these posters so special? Well, stone lithography is a process. I don't un n understand it completely, but essentially each color on the poster is run over a separate stone. So it's a very uh, labor-intensive process. Uh, process which began, I guess, in the 20s and was used primarily in, uh, used almost always through the 30s. And then from the 40s on, most of the studios turned into offset printing rather than stone lithography. And like um, some of them, like 20th Century Fox, which had a very distinct style with a lot of atmosphere in all their posters. Um, they would have one style, one sheet would be stone lithography, and the other would be offset. Huh. So, uh, so you could always see the difference. And, and what offset did, it gave you a texture and a depth uh, uh, of lushness that, the, that offset just didn't have. And it also ha had a combination of, po of, of, of colors that you could create um, differently than, than you know, with offset as well. Um, yeah, no, once you see stone lithography, you, you, never you know it. it. Yeah. You know it. Um, Which ones, so people can look? Are there any out there that uh, are stone lithography? Well, Redhead Woman is. Um, uh, I think Border Town is. Uh, what price Hollywood is? I'm pretty sure that Trader Horn must be, and go, uh, Dawn Patrol. Dawn Patrol. Be, yeah. yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, talk. I mean, Border Town is one of the posters that I really oh, yeah. very intense out there. What makes that special for you? What What grabbed you about? Well. It? 
I, I've never seen Bordertown. Yeah, I, I haven't either. <laughs> I, I don't know Bordertown, and I remember seeing it for the first time at uh, uh, a memorabilia shop on um, that Bob Coleman had on La Cienica, and no, I didn't see it there. It was in a book that that, mm. that was uh, that was done that Steve Shapiro did, and it was and you just looked at it and it was just a knockout. I mean, it was just jaw dropping because of the design. It was classic Betty Davis in full cigarette mold <laughs> and, and had the mode and uh, Paul Muni in the back and just the lettering and the, and, the, and the type style and the way everything was positioned. And it's also, she's wearing a dress that kind of fades into the background, which is kind of a fading technique, which I like also. Yeah. So that, so the outline of the dress isn't 100%, it goes right into the background. It's, it's just a beautiful, it's just beautiful. I mean, it, regardless of what, for, uh, art form you would, uh, art mode you would be speaking about, it just stands out. I mean, you don't see anything like that. Yeah, no, and it's really, no matter how I many mean, posters you see, yeah, that one really so stands the, so, out. So the importance of the movie is totally irrelevant. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it says everything about her, but it's just a great, great design. Yeah. I, I think it's in here somewhere. It must be in there. Well, it's on the wall. Yeah, it's on the <laughs> wall. <laughs> we can definitely see it. Yeah. What about, you know, the other one that interested me that I want to ask you about yeah, was, oh, there it is. It there it is. It's, it's quite an image. So it's, wow. just, it's just beautiful. <laughs> I mean, it's just provocative and intense and it just... Uh, you know, you want to see the movie if it comes on TCM, but it's irrelevant whether or not you see it or not. But you know, that really, that was why they made these posters. And exactly. I mean, I remember Robert Osborne saying when we, when we did a, the exhibit at the Academy that he just went through where he said, these posters are made so when you drove by, you knew who was going to be in it, you knew what they were going to be like, and you wanted to go in. Yeah, yeah. And that's not the situation anymore. Yeah. And probably because posters aren't as important to yeah. begin with, and they, it, they want to take the easy way out of just yeah. using... But it's wonderful Doug. that, you know, something that was really put together with a commercial purpose. I mean, this was, these people were not thinking they were making high art. No, they, but no, no, they weren't. And Warner Brothers, which is uh, from the th early 30s in my favor, this is Warner Brothers, as is Dawn Patrol, the way they used their, um, their title treatment and the way they positioned the, the credits were just, so, were, were, were just so elegant and... and uh, as the 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 artists who did it, they were they had a, they had a staff of uh, uh, studio artists at all the major studios who were working on the posters. They just created uh, their their own style, and uh, as you said, they weren't thinking about it as high art. They just created something that they wanted. Yeah, and they were trying to sell things. Yeah, you know, I mean, it's and 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 it was starling. It was. Um, yeah. yeah, it doesn't exist anymore, yeah. unfortunately. Well, I was curious about one of the ones that's up there that I want to ask you about is Red-Headed Woman, which is like uh -huh. almost all red. I mean, that seems kind of, a, it must have been kind of a daring thing at the time. <laughs> that was very rare. It's, it's very rare, and it's, it's really very beautiful. And um, it is, um, it's, it's, it's one of the most desired posters. Um, there are two copies of it. This is one of them. Yeah. And... Um, what I find about it is it's, it's all red. It's just her face. It's shades of red um, with the white lettering. But it's got this kind of curvature showing it's where her chin is leading, leaning against her shoulder. And it's yeah. very sensual with just that one little line. You can o almost imagine her entire body from that line. And it's just really uh, an elegant piece of art. Yeah. And... Uh, uh, I think I got this at Sotheby's or Christie's in New York when they were the ones who were doing the big um, yeah. movie posters, auctions. How do you hear about some of these things? I mean, do people know you when you were in your, the prime of your buying days? Did people like, did you get clandestine yeah. phone calls, yeah. people saying, you know, meet me on a corner? It, well, it wasn't quite like that, but, but uh, you know, you, you would hunt it down. You'd either, either go after, if you heard that someone had it, you'd try to locate them, or... On occasion, I would I would get the call as well, yeah. um, and then there's certain dealers that I would know that would tell me that they're getting something in, so yeah. come by at a particular time, <laughs> and you have to come by because otherwise it might be gone on the following day. Yeah. Um, it was it, 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 the hunt for them is is I think with any collector is just part of the 
part of the uh, thrill and part of the uh, part of the habit, part yeah. of the addiction. Are know. there are there any uh, hunt stories that come to mind? Uh, well, beside the uh, the um, the, uh, the Errol Flynn one. The Errol yeah. Flynn one. Um, well, it wasn't really a hunt because I didn't know it existed, but um, I must be 10 or 15 years ago, there were, there were a group of people who, uh, some I think had worked at the academy, and, and, and they put together a, a whole group of posters no one had seen before, and they were called poster partners. And um, they, dis they displayed some of them at uh, one of the memorabilia shows that was held in Glendale, and one of the posters was of Orphans of the Storm, which is from 1920, which is out there. And um, I was very friendly with Lillian Gish, and we worked together several times, and it was just a beautiful poster. And um, that wasn't, I guess, a hunt. It was a hunt to raise the money to buy it, but it wasn't a, a, hunt, a <laughs> hunt to find it. What, uh, you know, you worked, as, as Michael mentioned, you worked as a, as a you know, involved in distributing films and producing films mm -hmm. and campaigns for films and designing posters. What did that do to your c collecting taste? To actually, how, how did your collecting impact your work when you had new films to deal with? Well, I still, when there was Movie Collectors World uh, coming out every two weeks, I was still waiting for that issue yeah. to come out no, no matter what. I think I used um, certain, I think uh, subconsciously certain design uh, elements that I found in the in the pieces that I was collecting. Um, one that I did, which um, is sort of an interesting story, it's not in the book because it's a new poster, it was a poster I did for um, Robert Altman film called Kansas City, about jazz in the 30s in Kansas City. And um, the film had kind of two leading ladies in it, Jennifer Jason Lee and Miranda Richardson. And kind of the force behind everything was Harry Belafonte as the gangster who, in giving brilliant performance. And um, there's a poster that I had on the wall called Blonde Crazy with um, James Cagney and Joan Blondell. And the image of those two reminded me of the relationship between um, Miranda Richardson and Jennifer Jason Lee, and the left side of it was of a policeman leering over them, which I positioned um, Harry Belafonte. Uh. So I kind of adapted that and used the 20th Century Fox lettering, so I was combining Warner Brothers and, and 20th Century Fox together to produce the poster. Yeah. And what happened was that there were several issues with it when it was done. But the one that really kind of threw me was that um, b one of Bob's credits was a film by Robert Altman, which you wanted to be fairly prominent. He also wrote the film. And so I had to clear it with the Writers Guild. And the Writers Guild, of all the guilds, one would have expected to be the most magnanimous about creating something, right? <laughs> well, because the, the lettering of a film by Robert Altman, I put in a different color, green, and everything else was a dark blue, they were objecting to it because I was favoring the, doc, the, the director, even though the director also had a screenwriting credit. <laughs> so I had, and I had to get Bob to write a letter, Frank Barheide to write a letter, who was the co-writer of it, saying they had no objections to it, and the Writers Guild still wouldn't grant permission of it, but we used oh it God. anyway. <laughs> <laughs> the hunt for these posters, I mean, is it competitive? Are there people who, when you were doing this seriously? Oh, yeah. No, that's definite. What was that like? Well, it was, uh, you just had to move quickly. <laughs> I mean, there wasn't any... Um, there wasn't any uh, 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 other way of doing it. I mean, there were people that, I, I even forgot, I think that you could pay extra for uh, FedEx overnight or something that you yeah. could get at like six o'clock in the morning yeah. before noon or something, and there were uh, collectors that did it. And I remember once on Bob, with Bob in Bob Coleman's shop, he had a, uh, a poster of um, My Man Godfrey uh, it was silent, I didn't particularly like because it didn't look, look like Lombard, but it was a great poster. It 
it was a great film and whatever, and I was ready to buy it, and he had took a phone call while I was debating, <laughs> and it was from another dealer oh who God. snapped it up while I was in the shop oh my God. before I could say it. I mean, really? He, yeah, yeah. Oh, my God. Yeah. Oh, did you yell at him? What did you do? Uh, yeah, I was furious. I ran out, slammed the door, and went out of the store. I mean, it was furious. <laughs> I mean, I was about ready to say, and the phone rang, and he... <laughs> do those still get to you, the ones that got away? Yeah, yeah, they do. They do. Are there ones you mentioned? Are there ones you're, like, looking for? If they came, uh, came around, you would consider buying? There probably are. I don't really know. I can't really think of one right now, but I'm sure maybe by the end of the conversation <laughs> I will. I can't, uh, um, no, I think I've got, I, I've got almost everything that I think I, I yeah. could, could, I want. Mm -hmm. um, I don't really want any, I mean, the responsibility of maintaining this is really enormous. And, um, um, so getting any more is not really uh, my focus. My focus is re really, hopefully, to find a home for the collection yeah. so that it's not dispersed and uh, people can appreciate it forever. So that's what um, the do goal is. You know, that's a good question. I mean, where are they? I mean, do you have to find a big storage area and you have to worry about climate control and things like that? Well, I've got a storage area in, uh, in L.A. that's... that's uh, kind of high-end and expensive and climate controlled and limited hours and cameras and all of that. And then I've got the ones since I moved to um, Idaho or in Idaho, which is, uh, the climate's pretty good for them there. And, uh, but just keeping track of them and it's just really a, a huge, huge um, responsibility. The storage, I can hardly get into it anymore. I have an assistant who helps me when I'm here to get when we had to move the second set of posters to LACMA last week, I mean, he had, he's a genius guy who's, who climbs up all over the place and gets the right ones, and we found, wow. found them. And so uh, it's a real uh, challenge. Mm -hmm. So I don't have much room anywhere for, for, for anymore, so maybe that's a good thing. <laughs> that's, Um, can I ask if, if uh, someone in the audience has questions? We can take them. So, oh, do you do you guys mind if sure. to answer? Sure. Oh, great. And before the Second World War, and uh, they called them lobby cards. They did not call them posters. And I want to know if it's the same thing. Lobby cards are in posters. Um, right. Lobby They may have called all of the campaign material lobby, lobby cards. Lobby cards. But lobby cards were Smaller. Uh, eight, 8 by 10 or 11 by 14 that were oh. used in, in a set of eight usually. Right. And that were had special frames in each of the theaters just for the lobby cards. Right. So he may have just made the lobby cards. And usually with the lobby cards, it was one title card which had artwork on it. And the other seven would have the artwork right. on the border. And usually they were photographic and that were uh, in color. Right. And what he told me during the Second World War, because paper was so scarce, they would get them back and print on the other side. Have you ever seen any that are printed on both sides? I haven't seen them here, but, but oh. w w there is one country where it's very prominent that it happens in, and that's in Belgium because of the paper shortage. So on a lot of the posters that were printed during that period, right. on the back of them, are there are maps. So they were printed them on the other side of maps. Right. He told me that they did that here, too. Uh, I haven't seen those in, with, uh, in America. I though, haven't so either. So that's interesting. Well, Mike, let me just ask you one more thing before we take it uh, back to the audience. I mean, the idea, you know, the movie business was centered here. The idea of these posters finding a home here in Los Angeles, this has to be very exciting for you. It's where it should be. I mean, uh, even though, uh, say, a th third of the collection are foreign posters, they're, they're all foreign posters of American films. Yeah. And so um, they should remain here. And um, I think that, I mean, the mission is, I've always thought, I think it's a unique art form, and I think it's more unique now because there's nothing like it that exists anymore. 
And for people who see them for the first time, Largely, they're really t taken with them because they don't see artwork and painting and illustration and graphics done this way anymore. So it's a whole, it's just a separate, it's, it's just a separate form that doesn't exist in people when they're exposed to it. They're really, they're really knocked out by it. And then when they see the foreign posters, which the, with the different sizes, uh, they were never aware that they were that size. The first um, exhibit I did was with, um, Turner Classic Movies at the Hollywood Roosevelt for, for one of the dance poster exhibits. And the pe and when I, we went through the images, they never saw the posters, but when they saw the size of the posters, they were just blown away. They had no idea that they were, they were made, made, they were created that way. Yeah. So yeah. that's a fascinating thing also, just to see how each country's, each country's size is different and besides, you know, what they selected as the image. Yeah, yeah. Can you talk to us a little bit about the refurbishing process that you go through? Because I'm sure every poster isn't impeccable when you when you get it. Yeah, well, it depends. I mean, people, the most valuable ones are, are, are the, that you want to get are mint posters. But uh, that's rare. And so what usually happens, the, the, the posters, mostly that you get were folded. So the way they look pristine is when they're put on linen. And so you can get a you can get practically a near mint poster that you put on linen and, and it, it looks mint that's like it's never been used before. Then you've got the process of if you got got parts of the poster missing, um, usually at the folds or it could be bigger bigger sections. And then there there are restorers that that um, fix that, and so they would would color it in or. Um, paint it if they had to. Um, so it, it just depends on the poster. And they can also clean it so that it becomes brighter because if it's been exposed and it's dusty or uh, it's been damaged by uh, the sun or whatever. So there are very different degrees of restoration that you can have done. And there are uh, several, uh, two or three in the LA area. And they're mainly in, in uh, s the Southern California area that that I know of. Yes. Uh, oh. I have two questions. One is, could you speak a little bit about the posters that you've created? And also, are there any films or campaigns in the last 10 or 15 years that you think have achieved some of the heights of the golden age? Well, I was thinking about that today. Um, t today, the, uh, there was a, a poster that I saw recently of the shape of water i don't know if it's the final poster it was it was um kind of like a beige drawing of uh, sally hawkins and um the creature uh which i thought was effective except i thought i didn't like beige i thought it, i thought it was a little too um beige <laughs> I want a little bit of uh, green or blue in it. Um, and um, I can't, I was thinking of that today. There was a, an art director at Lionsgate for a while. I don't know if he's still there. And he did some very interesting posters. And I can't remember anyone in particular except there was one for, and it wasn't artwork actually, it was um, for a movie about um, Saddam Hussein's crazy son. Um, with Dominic Cooper giving a, an amazing performance, and it was kind of all gold because he dressed himself in gold, and, and the way he did that I thought was was very good. The ones that I've done have all been um, I've usually try to work with um, either artists or illustrators that uh, I liked or found, or um, yeah, or just went after. I've worked with uh, Philip Castle, who did Clockwork Orange eight different times, and usually I would go to him first for his ideas, regardless of whether or not he becomes the final artist who does it. Um, um, I worked with, br briefly, um, when I was distributing, I distributed a film which was about David Hockney called A Bigger Splash, and um, um, I, I used um, the key painting uh, which the 
film is about as the background, but I had to eliminate a section of it in order for it to fit the British quad style. So I was very um, nervous going up to see David Hockney to tell him I'm going to have to cut his painting uh, in order to fit it in. But he was totally accepted it, and uh, that was an interesting experience. And actually, the section that, um, that uh, we had to do when it came back, that section was outlined in white. And I, w I was really upset about that because everything else sort of had like a golden um, hue around, the, around the, uh, the, the water. And, but it really works because that's a section that's highlighted and it's the most important part of the movie, so it all worked out. And um, with Clockwork, Clockwork was really, uh, that was really the first one after 2001, but that was the first one that was created from artwork. And um, that was a unique situation because um, um, there were two campaigns, there were two, p two artists that, that we chose. One was Philip Castle, the other painted called Dougie Fields. And Philip was always late coming in, and the other one was all ready to go when he came in with a black and white drawing, which today, no one would let him continue with it, but he had the elements in it, and um, it was a triangle with uh, Malcolm McDowell and the uh, Corova Milk Bar Girls, and Stanley had about 50 different proportion variations between Malcolm's image with the knife, the triangle, and, and whether it was one girl or two, and then I added a couple of more as well. So that was a really fascinating exercise in how uh, we completed it, which took about eight weeks, I think. E each one that I've done, is, there's a story of <laughs> drama con collect connected to it. Back in the 1950s, I worked at Warner Brothers, and I, on occasion, had reason to go to the Looney Tunes building. And I noticed that periodically, they would take stacks of cells from Porky Pig and Bugs and all the rest of it and burn them by the dozens. And I'm wondering, do you have any memory or knowledge of them doing it with your posters and lobby cards? No, not with, not with mine, but I, I know that that's a terrible part of film history where a lot of stuff was, uh, was burned. I remember someone who worked with me, Charlie Lippincott, found out during the MGM auction period um, that they were destroying a lot of trailers and negatives in some, in some landfill somewhere. And he went out in the middle of the night to kind of retrieve them. But that was, uh, and John Coble, who is uh, a, a very famous collector with all of the photographs of uh, Harrell and stuff, um, that's where he got a lot of his posters through going through dumpsters. Uh, at 20th Century Fox and other studios. So there was no appreciation, there was no appreciation of, of that material and certainly none of posters. I mean, posters were disposable. They went from one theater to another and by the time they got to the fourth theater, they were probably torn or ripped up or you couldn't show them anymore. So that's why they're so, so they're so, 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 so scarce. Not like today where you can buy them in the store. Yeah, and also, you know, they felt that way, we forget this as well, they felt that way about the films. I mean, a great percentage exactly. of silent films were just thrown away. Mm -hmm. You know, I forget what the percentage is of surviving silent films, but it's like, I don't know, I think under 20%. Right, right. And they were, you know, they were dumped, you know, out in, you know, out in the ocean off of Santa Monica. A lot of things were done with them. They didn't think any of this stuff was, was, worth, was worth preserving. Right, right. I mean, so we are, we are, we are, we're, we're lucky to have what we have. Exactly. Exactly. You said that that um, like Warner Brothers had a stable of artists, and I would assume that 20th did too, and each mm -hmm. of the studios did. Can you tell by looking at a poster if it's a Warner's poster? Was there a style that yeah, the studios? Yeah, I, I went can for? definitely tell that. Yeah, e each one had their, had their own style. Sometimes, Warner Brothers certainly did during that peak period that I think of, like the late 20s to like 1936. Um, MGM 
did uh, two different periods. Um, by like the mid-30s, they kind of all went to almost, and all their posters had an all-white background, and you could tell the, uh, the artist was um, Vincentini. Uh, and Paramount and RKO had, had very rich, lush styles, and 20th Century Fox, as I said, was really atmospheric. They always had in their, um, most of their posters, you knew the setting of the film and whether it was a Western or an adventure film or Suez, you were in the desert or, or, or uh, in old Chicago, the fire was bright red and you could see, uh, see what was going on. So they each had their own, each had their own styles and some of them had their own, uh, and they had their own artists who had their own styles. Hi, Mike. Hi, Deborah. Hi. Uh, what is the chicken and what is the egg in terms of the scope, the size of these works of art and the architecture where they lived? You talked about the European posters were so much larger mm -hmm. than ours, but we think of Europe as all teensy and they don't have the space that we do. So um, I'm just wondering, can you talk about, uh, pick some point in time and talk about a movie theater, and where would a poster be? Well, I don't, I don't know what was in, what was in the uh, theaters in in Europe, and and how they displayed them. I'm assuming they had some kind of frames, but the French posters, for instance, are still the same size that they are now, 47 by 63. And if you go to, uh, in the Champs Elysees in Paris, and you see the, 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 the movie posters, they're all that size. Why they made them that size? I don't know, except that um, I think in in Europe, particularly in France, they held movie posters and posters and movies in a higher regard than than they did here, and maybe they felt they needed that that space. In Austria, I have no idea why the Austrian posters are that large. I mean, they must have had smaller ones, but the ones that you see now, which must have been the most prevalent, are the nine feet tall beauties. In Belgium. Um, which is a smaller country, they are, um, they're like a, uh, 14 by 22 or 11 by 22. And what's interesting there is that when CinemaScope came in, all of the CinemaScope posters, the scope posters in Belgium are scope pr proportion. So they are horizontal. And it's the only country that I know that did that. <laughs> so, um, you know, someone clever decided to do that. I, you know, I don't know. street like um, advertisements on the street yeah I remember being in Europe and seeing big advertisements on the street yeah. well we had billboards and things they just had like they would put things up yeah well we had them also on building building sites here we used to call it wild posting when I began and you still see it I guess on buildings uh, on building sites here and a lot of them like uh, the bigger size American posters on, when they're on building sites or on billboards, they, are, they, they completely disappear because you can't remove them. They're just gone once they're up. So, yeah. We have time for a couple more questions, if there are any, from the audience. Okay, yes, one more. Hey, um, thank you so much. This is really great. Um, one question, you mentioned some American artists. You mentioned Hirschfeld and, and Bass, but given the international emphasis on a lot of your collection. I was just curious if there's some designers that, or artists that you um, really would love. And one thing you didn't mention, I personally love the Italian artists, the Ballesters and the Martinatis. I was just curious what you think of them and if there's others that you recommend. Yeah, well, two things. One, um, except for very rare occasions, like with Norman Rockwell, uh, the, the artists for American posters were, were, didn't sign their posters. They weren't allowed to sign their posters. Um, I, in fact, ran into that Warner Brothers with the last one that I did, and it was really crazy. But uh, they wanted, when they finally agreed to put it on the DVD, they wanted, me, they wanted me to get permission from the artist that he wanted his name on it. I mean, <laughs> ridiculous. Anyway. Um, the Italian posters, there was supposed to be one in it uh, that was just too big, which was, which was by Brini. Um, he's one of the best Italian des uh, poster designers, Martinotti, Ballester. There's one in, um, 
the, the next selection by Sergio Gajulo, who's not as well collected, but he's really my favorite. And, and he actually has done posters in more countries than any other artist, including America. He's done posters in like nine different countries. Um, and then um, the, the, the Italian, almost all the major uh, and minor films that are, that are painting, in painters, painters, that are paintings in the artwork are signed. And that's true in France, and that's in tr true in uh, Sweden as well. Uh, there's a great Swedish artist called Moje Ashland, um, and two of his are going to be in the next um, in the next um, the next uh, installation. And there's a section in the book of five or six uh, Swedish posters as well, so you can see how they vary. Um, but it's just a shame that American artists were not allowed to put their names on. On their, p on their work. I haven't really got a question, but I'm going to I'm going to embarrass Mike by saying a, a very public thank you. I'm um, about 20 years ago. I did this very little British film called Croupier, which was destined to go um, straight to British television, and the producers who made the film didn't particularly like it. And Mike Kaplan saw the movie and loved the movie and came over to the States with it and championed the movie and screened the movie for various people. And then he managed to hustle up a very, very modest little distribution. I think there were like six little independent films released for about two weeks. And if any of them got good reviews, they might run with it. And luckily, Croupier got some pretty good reviews. And this man tenaciously then set about never sort of giving them a minute's rest and keeping that film going and using the reviews and putting together some really brilliant changeable posters and it was the era where a film could stay in the cinema for maybe a year. And anyway, the long and the short of it is that film completely changed my life, changed my career and it's all down to this guy here. So I wanna say a big thank you. Well, it was a great film and worth doing. I think that's a perfect way to end the, uh, end the... Thank you for Ken and thank you for Mike.